tonight, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, where we all get together at Quick Fix Golf to talk golf and meet with some of the top leaders in the industry. We've got a big one here tonight, Sarah Stone, PGA Pro. And we're really looking forward to find out what she has to say about the golf swing, about how she teaches and everything else that goes with it. So welcome to Quick Fix Golf, which is brought to you by... By me, <laughs> Darren Amelie. And uh, my business partner, Bobby Lopez, played on the European tour for a few years. And we're That's the PGA we hang pros. Out. Yeah, we're the PGA pros at Tupelo Bay. And Darren, tell them what we want them to do. What we want you to do is get your cell phone out and take a video of your golf swing and send it to us. And we've got this neat feature right now where you, you can upload it right to the website immediately. We'll send you back an analysis and give you some drills to work on. And it's the best analysis that money can't buy. You know why? Because it's free. Not a penny out of your pocket. We'll get you going because we want you to play better golf. Hold on. Somebody's got that microphone on. There we go. I got it. And you can show us a little love out there, folks. And punch that like button because that helps our SEO. And subscribe and ring the bell so you can... No, we're having another outfit, you know, another session going on so we can get to it. And here we are. Sarah, you have some explaining to do. <laughs> oh, yeah, Lucy. That's a nice picture of you. Thank you. Let me grab, let me guess, that was at the Cree Club? No, that was at Westchester Country Club. Oh, okay. All right, good guess, though. Yeah. Well, Darren, you had the first question. Yeah, so Sarah is a director of instruction now at Chevy Chase in, in Maryland. And uh, just explain a little bit to our, our listeners, what, what is uh, Chevy Chase, a little history of the place, and, and what you're doing there? Sure, so the club was founded, I'll just give it a little brief, over on in 1892 by a group of gentlemen from the uh, Metro Club of D.C. Started out as a hunting club, actually, and then became a six-hole golf course, and then a nine-hole, and then in the history that I've come to read and understand is Donald Ross was the original designer in 1909 of the 18 hole golf course. It's gone through a few renovations since then. So I don't know if he would actually take credit for it now, but the greens definitely represent his designs. There's 18 holes, there's 17 tennis courts, there's paddle, there's an outdoor hockey rink, there's bowling, there's guest houses. And the Curtis cup actually was hosted there back in 1934, which the U S won six and a half to two and a half. Okay, so, so they still have paddle. What about um, what's that that crazy new um, pickleball? Yeah, that's pickleball. That's, any pickleball? Oh yeah, it's, it's creating yeah. Some, okay. some animosity between the tennis and the paddle. I bet, right? Did, did Gene Saracen invent the sand wedge there? Aaron's <laughs> still looking for who who invented no, what, what no, was no, the, no, no, no. the sand wedge. Gene Saracen invented the sand wedge at Brooklawn Country Club. No, he didn't. It's at Palmacy in Tampa. Okay, well, um, <laughs> I disagree, but anyway. So and we've right. also had some presidents, like President Taft was a member there. Um, Dwight Eisenhower played there. We have some cool pictures around of of different different, um, like uh, the Duke of of um, Edinburgh was there. Just just some cool history. People coming through the D.C. area and playing that golf course. As a student of the games here, I, I mean, you're always out there traveling and reading and. Uh, putting yourself in front of the best people in the game and in the industry, who who would you say has influenced you the most? And um, you don't have to say uh, me. So, besides <laughs> myself, um, that's that's a tough one. I mean, I think in my journey. I mean, I, if the list is kind of long. I mean, I would say I've ran into a lot of great coaches and tried to figure out who they had spent time with. And Mac O'Grady's name kept coming up, so I spent time with him. Then I, uh, Mike Adams and Terry Rolls have been tremendously influential in my ability to help people get better really fast. David Orr, I totally 100% for putting. You know, there's been a bunch of different people who have influenced different areas of my coaching. Jeff Leishman, being a total coach, he's at the Die Preserve. You know, the first time I met him, he's at the gym watching his players work out, talking with their trainer about what he was doing with their golf swing. And this was like 12 or 15 years ago. So he was already doing full coaching. Um, it's hard to just nail down one, Darren. I wish I could, but um, takes an army. Okay. <laughs> okay, well that that was the wrong answer. You should have said Jack Nicholas, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I met him later in my career, so. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, here's my question. I hear women complain about their breasts getting in the way. What's the solution? Take them for a ride. <laughs> use them, hug them, and use them. Well, I just know, can't. Go ahead. I just can't handle coaches that are like, put them on top, put them one under, one on top. I mean, I just, I mean, just tell them to hug them and, and take them for a ride. Well, I, I like Cesar Sunudo used to always. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but Caesar used to play on the European tour and played some in America. He was friends with Trevino. He would put a towel around you, you know, under both arms. And I say, that's the same feeling. If you just feel like you're keeping your elbows up against your body and you just sort of squeeze them. Yeah. I mean, Mac was big on pressure points and he liked the one under your armpit and just in the center of your arm. And just, I kind of just put them on this. That's why I say, just give them a little hug as long as they don't get disconnected. Well, you don't want to have them disconnected. That's for sure. Nobody wants that to happen. <laughs> Your arms disconnected. Oh, the arms. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you got me scared here for a second. It's a good question. Oh, I got a million of them. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, we've had a lot of people on the show and, and about the future of instruction. And I know you're really big into technology and I know you use all of it. But where do you see the future going? Do you think we're going to continue to use uh, technology, are we going to go back to some of the old school ways of thinking? What, what What's your thought on that? So I, I thought about this question for a little bit and since you sent me the email and you know, it's going towards like four dimensional movement, but it's like that being having access to that is really hard putting it on your clients. I really think we're going to get into like medicines gone where it's like witch doctors and different things they think is what's going to happen. And then as we as coaches get to study the actual movements of the body psychology, biomechanics, then we can actually explain to clients what they're trying to do and show them how to do it instead of living off of like urban legends of like, keep your head down, keep your arms straight, stay still. You know what I mean? Like I think explaining how the sand wedge is designed and how it's supposed to be used and what you're supposed to do with it um, is, is I, that's what I think it's going is we, as coaches get to spend time understanding the actual physical movement of the golf club and the body, and then the messiness that is the human. And then we can then share it with them. And I hate the word simple, but in a way that they understand what they're trying to do. Does that make sense? What's the fourth dimension thing you're talking about? Like KVS? Yeah. Um, that there's all sorts of different. Now there's um what's it called sports box that Mike Adams and Terry Rolls are rolling out, which is where you can see the the player from all different views underneath on top from side on. It's kind of neat. It's more of a uh, animated version of yourself, so you can kind of see what's moving and the degrees that you're moving in. We had a Brett Brett McCabe on uh, about a year ago, maybe, and he was talking about how you know psychology is kind of the next frontier in, in golf instruction. And we're seeing a lot of it nowadays. Is that something that um, you're teaching or you're getting involved with? Yeah, I mean, I think psychology is important and people understanding um, like what they're trying, what, how, to, how to get out of things. But I think the level of player, at least that I'm seeing at, at, the, at the country club or the club level, just like understanding how to get the ball off the ground. And like Bobby said, what's the club face doing and do they know it? I mean, psychology is one element to it, but a lot of the players that I'm, I'm currently working with at, at the level that I am are more about the understanding of the tools and how they're designed to be used and what's the difference between them. Yeah. I mean, you know, in the bottom line is you say they want to play golf. They want to have a good time and you, 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 you complicate it too much to where they feel like robo golfer. Well, I also think an important question as a coach is to ask people like, what are, why are you playing golf? Like, and if they say like to be, to have fun, it's like, okay, then what's your definition of fun? I mean, that might be where the psychology gets into it as the coaching client aspect is, are we going for the same goal? You mean my mommy maybe is not a good answer? No. <laughs> <laughs> I do lead with that with kids sometimes. I'm like, are you here? Cause your parents are forcing you to, and they're like, yes. I'm like, okay, good. We're on the same page. <laughs> don't you hate those i mean they're no fun to teach i mean i think i think what's going on in golf instruction is so cool we have people you know the the swing catalyst understanding force and movement helps big time balance um helping people understand the three-dimensional movement of the body all of that is really it's just it's so much better i think for the coaches than it maybe it is for the clients one-on-one -on -one. all right darren you had another quote oh, this was 
Let's look at your article. You have an article out there. Yeah, the most recent one. This is good. Are you a frustrated new golfer? These four tips will help you. Look at that. You're a star. She is a star. So are you, Bobby. <laughs> uh, Sarah, yeah, you don't sorry. have a cameo yet, do you? A cameo? No. Yeah, no. Bobby's got his own cameo, so you got to oh, get a little that. catching up to Bobby. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah, I got the cheapest cameo out <laughs> $4. Four That's dollars. why I get hits because they're right. so cheap. <laughs> Nicholas is like 400 bucks a throw. I'm 1495. <laughs> <laughs> so you said use a T. I like I tell a lot of lady golfers that are up. starting out, use a T on, on the golf course. Let me throw that article up if you could. I'm trying to. It, it's it's okay. there's a picture of some poor looks like a Korean girl, I guess it's distraught. Where is the article that's in the golf magazine? Yeah, it's basically just four ways to have fun playing golf if you're learning. One is to always use a tee. If it's that's the difference use between a tea. frustration. Play a scramble. Play a scramble. That's a great way to stay social with the group. No one wants to be off in the woods slashing away. Don't try so hard. Yeah, that one I called, I told them they're allowed to quit. And I don't think that was the right verbiage they wanted. But basically, if, you, if you're hitting a seven iron and you can't get in the air, you're allowed to quit and go putt or chip or do something else. Is this for COVID foreplay from 150 yards? Uh, oh, it's the number four. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jeez. There's no reason you should feel obligated to play a course at full length. Hey, what do you think of that? What is it? What is it, Darren? At 36? Uh, yeah, operation 36. Yep. That's good. What do you think of that? It's it's great. We're using it with our junior golf program currently with a ton of success. So Sarah, one of the one of the things when I first started working for Druga, I was in, um, you know, my first year in college, and and watching him practice and being around him that first year, he always hit golf balls off of a tee with his irons, and uh, I, you know I was young at the time, I didn't understand why he was doing it, but you know he did it. It um, it took a level of performance away that you know the ball striking level of performance, so you can focus on. Whatever you're focusing on, whether it's your elbow, your grip, whatever it is, but I, I like that that you you talk about putting it on a tee. I think that's an important thing that even somebody at Jack Druga's level um, practiced with. Well, he got that from Jack Nicholas. That's his favorite golfer. I mean, Jack never practiced anytime he was going to change something. He wanted the lie to not be the influence on the ball flight. He wanted to be whatever he's like. You just said that Jack's doing it for it was. Uh, and I always use that example. Anytime some husband or wife is like, well, they shouldn't be using a T. I'm like the best player in the world did. So I think we're good. <laughs> Next question. Oh, yeah, this Whoa. is one of my favorites. Oh, I don't think you realize I stole this from you, but um, and I'm not really sure where you got it from, but it's it's what I call the, the chopstick drill. You, you have any idea what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's the under the arm putting drill. Yes, yep. Love it. I've got it here for. So that came from David Orr. Oh dear. Okay. Wrong. Whoops. That's me. He's at Campbell. Where I went. He was at Campbell where I went. Okay. So, and he has a really great know? article in golf.com about how to use this, this specifically for putting, but it's basically to help people understand that there's a lot of moving parts in putting and everyone tries to keep them still or move certain things or be a pendulum. Or whatever, but this drill helps you Here it just is. basically start to feel um, proper putting motion without thinking about a lot of different pieces. But no, this this came from David Orr, and, and if you look at my social media, I was pretty good about keeping him attached to it. But and I use it a lot too for chipping. There right? it is, right there. You see it now. Yep. So what do you do with these chopsticks, Sue? Well, the way that I do it is I, I put it like you can see young white here, put it under his armpits and down at the bottom there, there's a, uh, a rubber band and it just helps you create the feel of uh, how the arms are going to move, how the hands are quiet and how the, the shoulders and the body move. At least that's, that's how I explain it. Yeah. And it's, you're doing a little modification of it. Um, mostly like I'll have them put their hands through and push their, push their palms apart a bit. So I then you, you start to feel what the wrists are doing, like the segment of the hand and the and the upper arm or the forearm and then the wrist joint and how they kind of work together. But it's but it's yeah. it, it's fantastic for someone who's new to the game and they don't know how their body needs to move and it helps you um, explain that feel. 
It's also great for people who have some really inlaid poor concepts on how the putter moves and what uh, and both, the putter. But both of you guys work for Nicholas, right? Yes. Now, you know, he didn't do anything like this. Well, what he, he was very handsy in his putting. What, what, what would be the difference? Why, why? I know today everything's, you know, shoulders and everything's quiet hands and what have you, but in the old days, we had busy hands. Well, we also had longer greens, right? Well, yeah, the, the greens, the greens were, yeah, no doubt about it. In I mean, you had seven, too, you had seven degrees so, left on the putter. So much thicker back then too. So well, you need to, you had to produce more force. So I think the wrist joint was probably, that's just my theory is more active back then was cause you had to, you'd create more acceleration. Somehow. Well, I, I was just trying to be a pain in the butt. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Plus, if someone's a good putter like Nicholas, I wouldn't put him in this. <laughs> you know, Sarah, let me ask you a question. You know, in my seven years around Jack, uh, he never practiced his putting. I saw him work with Rick Gomes a few times just on aim when he was using um, uh, using the laser aiming. When when you were when you were there, did did you see him? I know it was well after my time, but. Well, did he practice any putting? I know he wasn't in competition mode at that stage of the game, but. No, in the five seasons there, I, I don't think I saw him putt. No, but he was still good because he came in and played once and told us he had 200 feet of putts or, or 200 feet. Yeah, 200 feet of putts right. and holes or something, which we couldn't believe because we never see him on the putting green. <laughs> right. Everybody talks about practicing their putting, practicing their putting, and Nicholas never practiced his putting. Well, I never said he never did, but just around my time, my seven years, and, and Sarah's kind of confirming a little bit of hers, but. I mean, a little bit, because we could be related to his back, too. I mean, who knows why he didn't. Yeah, being bent over like that, I know when I spend a lot of time chipping, it bugs my back. But this, this is Remember? a good drill, very good drill. Yep. We go back. Darren, you were there seven, seven seasons? Seven years, yeah, hard to believe. And I was working for Druga for three of them. I was kind of going back and forth. You probably loved hearing stories about that place, I'm sure. <laughs> well, Jack was always upset that I never worked at Seminole. I, you know, he, he always wanted me to kind of go down that road. And I kind of went off a different road, but. He's forgiven me by now. You didn't work at Seminole? No. Bobby, have you spent any time with Jack Nicholas? Oh, don't get him going. <laughs> the first time I met Jack Nicholas, I pissed him off. <laughs> <laughs> what happened was it was 1972 and we had the World Cup at the golf course where I was the director of golf in Marbella, Spain. And I told Barbara and I told Jackie, because Jackie was sort of bored. Jackie then was about maybe 11 or 12. I said, I'll take Jackie to play golf because he was bored to death. And at that time, Jack didn't want the kids or anybody in, in the front row of the, of the gallery. He didn't want them to see, he didn't want to see them. And uh, so I told him, I'll take him out to play golf the next day. He said, oh, that'd be great. So the next morning, I call up to the room and Barbara answers the phone. And I says, is, 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 uh, is Jackie ready to go? And he goes, no, he's sleeping. I said, oh, wow, well, that's cool. So then I go to the golf course and I run up to the eighth hole and there's Jack and Johnny Miller. And they were dogging it, see? <laughs> and when Jack looked at me, he waved. And I went like this and put my hands on my cheek like, like somebody's sleeping. And he got a look on his face. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And when, we, when he got back in at 18, I said, Jack, I was trying to tell you. He says, and he wouldn't let me finish. He says, he says, I know what you meant. I said, look, if you guys were dogging it, don't blame me. <laughs> I was 22 at the time, so. But I did make money the first round. Uh, Angel uh, was Angel Gallardo and Valentin Barrios were the two players from Spain. See, and we were in the, we were in the locker room, and they said nobody's going to shoot under seventy in this golf course. It's too hard. I said, No, you're wrong. I said, I know I can shoot under seventy, and I know I'm not as good as Nicholas. I said they'll both shoot under seventy first day. And they said, No, no way. I said, Okay, how many pesetas you want to bet? And we bet, and uh, the first day, Danny Miller shot sixty five, and Nicholas shot sixty eight. <laughs> So uh, that was back in the days when we dominated. We don't dominate. Darren, what are we going to ask yeah. about this drill right oh, here? Oh, yeah. 
Um, please tell us about the time you spent with, with Mac Grady. I'm, I'm very interested to hear about this. Uh, well, unfortunately, I only got to spend five days with them, but they were about 14 hour days. Um, and then somebody told them that I was a certified stack and tilt camp member and I got booted. So I'm part of the booted group of Mac. Um, <laughs> you got booted? I got booted. Yeah. And when I find the guy that booted me, we're going to have a nice conversation. No. <laughs> Um, no, uh, like I said, I, I, I got to spend a lot of time with some great coaches and Mac's name kept coming up. So I sent him an email and he wanted to ask me who, who recommended him and he vetted me. And then we met in Miami. I think there were six of us there. Um, it was really interesting. There were a lot of alignment sticks involved as you can see in some of these photos. Um, definitely the further I get along in my coaching, I would say I spent, this was 2015. So we're six years away. I much more understand the stuff he was talking about now than I did at the time, but um, absolutely fascinating, brilliant man. I wish he shared more of his stuff. I think there would be a lot more better teachers out there because of that, for sure. Um, I heard he, he ruined Sevi. What? I heard he ruined Sevi. Or Sevi ruined Sevi, probably. Yeah, there's there's some stories about there about his hands and like rights and like squeezing the strength in his grip and it ruined his finesse or touch. Um, I mean, Mac was obsessed with Jack McLaus, as he called him. So um, his picture was used quite a bit. Who say um, that again, sir? Jack who? Nick Laus. Oh. <laughs> somebody, somebody got their uh, microphone on, please. Um, he was big into conspiracy theories, which was fun. He was big into fitness. He was big into uh, health and diet. Um, and, elephant uh, diet? Yep. He ate elephants? No, I don't know. He never talked about eating elephants. Um, but um, he, the, the reason that I absolutely, his short game stuff is why I'm as good at coaching at short game as I am. I could do it right and left, left handed. And, and the, the way that he showed us everything, everything he could do, he could do it from the right side of his body and the left side of his body, which was incredible. The One of the last nights he had us hit a 600 flop shot over a net that was probably 40 feet in the air from 15 feet away. I never thought I could do that. Well, you said 600? No. 60? 60. <laughs> 600? I wouldn't <laughs> be a trick shot artist. <laughs> um, but he was, I mean, like I said, he's a gift to the coaching community in the golf world. And unfortunately, he's very misunderstood. And he's very protective of his information and very suspicious of what you're doing with it. So, um yeah, that's that's amazing that you got to spend some time with them. I've tried to reach out several times. I get the cold shoulder every time, but um, yeah, he was the first guy to play with Metal Woods. Yeah, and he tried to enter the U.S. Open both as a right-handed and left-handed player, a qualifier. Wow. And there's some famous story. I think he maybe shared it about how he missed every green on purpose to see how well he could shoot. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody got their microphone on, please. If you can mute your mic, please. Thank you. Is there a significant difference between a male and a female golf swing? No. No difference whatsoever. I don't, I mean, no. I mean, no, I'm going to go with no. Our pelvises are shaped differently, which might affect it. Our wrist, thing, our wrist speed isn't as fast, but I would say in general, there's nothing I'm looking at being like, oh, this is a man. Let me look at his golf swing differently than a woman. I like it. You'll find flexibility has an info. In, 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 I mean, it can, but there's flexible men and flexible women, vice versa. What, what I would say about men versus women, Sarah, and, and I agree with you about the differences there. I would say that the women are by far more efficient than the men are. The men have, have more speed that they can um, they can kind of give up with as far as efficiency, but I think as far as, and I don't even really, I don't even know if you should call it as a, as a man, man or woman. It's it's just efficiency for club head speed and and how far the ball goes for you for your club head speed. And I think that, you know, some of the LPGA Tour players realize that, you know, in order for them to be at the top of the game, they've got to get every ounce out of uh, their club head speed, while the men can afford to to give up some of it. Yeah, I guess I would see the significant difference would be speed. That would be it. And and then where is that created from? You can argue all over the place on that. But yeah, I would go with Darren on that one. Speed. 
would be the biggest difference. And, and question. Who, mm, like oh, yeah. and, and, you know, we, we got to know what books you're reading. I mean, how many books a year do you read and, and what are some of the, the ones you've, you've had in your hands lately? How about Gone with the Wind? <laughs> yeah. That was years ago. I think that was AP English. <laughs> um, so right now I'm reading Relentless by Tim um, Grover. This was um, uh, Michael Jordan. I don't know if you ever heard of him, um, his trainer. Uh, great book for your career in life. I'm reading If You Have a Problem with Getting Along with People, Darren, Bobby, you know. <laughs> Bobby, for sure. <laughs> um, this one's called Liminal Think Thinking by David Gray. It's a, uh, it's a really, I mean, I got it cause I worked with somebody that I couldn't get along with years ago. And I was like, if it's not changing. So I need to figure out how to change it. So if, if you have somebody that's taken up way too much space in your brain in a negative way, this is a great book to figure out how to get out of it. And then man's search for meaning. I always go back and reread. I got this from McCabe, Brett McCabe, um, circling back to his name. Just a great book about a survivor of um, the Holocaust and devastation that you can't even imagine and how he came out of out of that and how it can affect your life. So I'm kind of all over the full. The, oh, and 12, the 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. Controversial author, but unbelievable life book for people looking to kind of be better or not not blame the world for their problems. <laughs> yeah, I'm bringing you Dr. Zeus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think I've ever read a book. <laughs> oh yeah, there's one book I've read: Ben Hogan's Five Lessons on the Fundamentals of Golf. I've read that thing about five hundred times, but outside of that book, that's the only book I've read. And then, obviously, working for for Jack, I, had, I read the uh, Golf My Way a, a bunch, a bunch of times. So, yeah. Yeah, I was the kind of kids in school when you know when you had the five minute break between classes. I'd run around to the smartest kids in the room and say, "What happened in the book last night?" There you go. That's smart. I like that. Efficient. If you call on me, I could I could rattle away on every. Oh well, this happened and that happened and this happened. Okay, sit down, Lopez. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Darren, I do post a lot on Instagram of the books that I'm reading because other people have helped influence kind of that or shared with me. So those oh, are I just saw things. Larry. I just saw Larry. Put on your mic and sing sing his Figaro. <laughs> go ahead. It, it, all right. Let me see if I can get it on. Oh, here we go. You're on. No, you turned it off. <laughs> you turned it off. <laughs> <laughs> you turned it off. Figaro, 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 Figaro. Oh, Eddie, kiss me goodnight. It's it's nice to see you, Larry. Glad you're <laughs> it's, great. it's great to be. I got back from a rehearsal and got in on the latter part of this. So, so Sarah, how can how can some of our um our listeners and viewers uh, get? in touch with you are you, are you big on instagram i know you're really big on facebook youtube and all what what yeah i i started i i'm definitely instagram is probably my mainstream and it's stone golf sense um my last name the word golf and then i wanted it to make sense anything that i talk about with golf swing so it's stone golf sense and then um i have a website also stone golf sense and then facebook as well and then youtube I, in the winter i'll have more videos i'm just crazy busy right yeah. now to do that but the best place to find me is Instagram. And tell us, tell us before we open up the, uh, the, the phones here, one good Jack story. You got one good one in your pocket there. I do have one good. All one. right. Um, and this one's okay to tell. So. Right. <laughs> You're still alive. Um, I, uh, so my last season was this last winter and I finally, he was working with one of his grandkids on the range. So I finally got enough, you know, let's go gusto to get up there. So I walked up and I was talking to Jack and I said, you know, what do you think about modern golf instruction starting to go towards more lead hill off the ground in the backswing, which we're seeing more with like Bubba and Matt Wolf. And, and he looked at me and he's like, oh, modern golf instruction. And he shook his head and I said, well, what do you, what do you think about the left heel? I mean, that's something that you picked up that you use. And he's like, only when I needed to. Right. And I love that <laughs> answer. It was like, only when I needed to. And that was what he left me with. And I was like, okay, yeah. that was, that was, a, that was a nugget. I got a nugget <laughs> out of him. So, so you say only with his driver? Only when he needed to. So I don't know right. if he's, you know, if he, <laughs> there's some iron shots where he's doing it, you know, slamming down and on seven irons, but not uh, not short game. But I thought that was a really good way of helping your clients with that, that lead heel lift. Well, I was just at a, at a school that somebody was running that I'm not going to say who, 
but they're they're all into the you know this sort of squatting and turn kind of a thing. Um, it concerns me because you know the average golfer is not going to be able to do that in the first place, especially if they're fifty plus. And you know you, you get into so much body motion. You know the the the, the, the golf like Darren says, Jack Nicholas for his first couple of years of, of life, Grab would only let him swing his arms. So he wouldn't let him use his body at all. Mm-hmm. You got to know how to swing. You know what path you want to swing the golf club, and where's the club face? Ball doesn't know if you lifted your foot or not. No, That's it doesn't. Fair. Right or right, let's uh, let's open up the mics. Has anybody got any questions for Sarah? Uh, 